If you'd like to contact the show, send us an email at liveonfourlegspodcast at gmail.com or follow us on any of our social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, at Live on Four Legs Podcast, and on Twitter, at Live on Four Legs Pod. I'm sure you've heard all the... I mean, it's nice. This is the home of the Cox. I feel right at home. So who's... uh, That's basketball, yeah? It's... Is there a guy, like, who's the biggest cock? No, no, not the president. I mean, the basketball player. And away we go. You're listening to Live on Four Legs, the live Pearl Jam podcast experience featuring... Mr. Stone Gossett. Fucking camera in the jump. everybody now welcome to live on four legs the definitive live pearl jam podcast and whether you tuning in for the first time second time third time count them all up we are on episode number 118 by now if you've listened to all of those congratulations you you are just you're a champion in our book and we salute you and bow to you uh but if you've listened to only a couple episodes of this welcome back and uh today we're going to be doing a show from 2008 not too too long ago but it's still like it's what 12 years in the past i can't do the quick math (laughs) 11 years almost 13 yeah yeah, it's 13 years ago that this happened so yeah it it is it's getting on in years but you know it's enough where it's fresh but we can still kind of look at it historically so it'll be interesting and the era is kind of interesting and there's some uh good topics to talk about so why not get into it all? Randy Sobel over here, John Farr over there. Hello. Yo. Hi. Um, what about 2008 is, what's your favorite thing about the, the year and the touring year? It's just all the stuff that, that came back, man. This was, you know, we talk about 2006, you had a lot of stuff come back. Dirty Frank, Leash, you know, a lot of the songs. And 2008, you know, they were kind of like, the avocado era was kind of winding down, so this tour was like, "Hey, let's just throw some stuff at the wall and let's play some stuff we haven't played before." And let's, and they were a lot of stuff got brought back on this that hadn't been played in a long time. A lot of stuff was getting debuted and stuff, and I just love that that these set lists are so wide open and diverse. Like a lot of albums represented, this one especially heavy on no code, which I love, and uh, yeah, just just a lot of fun fun shows. Yeah, there were 13 of them. They all happened pr- predominantly in the, on the East Coast. And then kind of, you know, at Bonnaroo, that was a big show that we did uh, last summer. And that one pretty much encapsulates everything that came back from this year or started from this year. So you have things like Who You Are was the first time that they had played it in the Matt Cameron era. All Night, which is a song that they played at this show, had had its debut and it was basically sprinkled all throughout uh this this entire tour wma played for the first time 
as a full song since 1995. And so, the new way too. We'll talk about that too. A little different exactly, version of WMA. Right. A little acoustic, a little bit different. You're right. So yeah, they're, they're changing things up and they're also, it's, it's very, it's very lost dog heavy. I feel like at this time y- you said it, it's in the middle of avocado and they can kind of give you a little bit of the treats. And this is, you know, all along the East Coast leg, it's during the summer, so people can be traveling. Most of these shows have at least one or two very, very rare songs in them. Yeah, definitely. And actually, I was thinking about this too. Like, this is, you know, down in my neck of the woods down here in the Southeast. And I was trying to think back, like, I wonder why I didn't go to this. Yeah, where were you? Like, maybe money was the issue. I, you, know, I, you know, I was working and like, or that I, I don't remember. Were they doing the the web website lottery for these at this time? I don't remember. They might, I, I don't know if they were doing that yet or not. But yeah. for whatever reason, this this just I don't remember it being on my radar. But that could have been just a function of time as well. Like it was, it was a long time ago. So yeah, I don't, I don't remember why I wasn't at this because I I went to Columbia in twenty sixteen. That was a great show. It's just a just a couple of quick hours there and back. So yeah, I wish I had gone. And I think this is the first time that they were in the city of Columbia. They had mentioned it before, right. and right. obviously. How funny is that, that the the last three weeks, this is basically like college month that we're doing. February is basically college <laughs> month here on Live on Four Legs because we did Lincoln, and that's obviously uh, University of Nebraska and, and the Cornhuskers. And then last week we did Ann Arbor, of course, the Wolverines, and, and this week uh, the Cox. So yep. Yep. <laughs> we go kind of uh, all down the line there. So. Yeah, lots of lots of different things uh, to talk about. Uh, you wanted to bring something up before we get into talking about 2008 stuff. Like, what, what's what's on your mind for, for for today? Yeah, I just wanted to. You know, it's it's now it's 2021. You know, we've we've got people getting vaccines. You know, we we hope and and pray that you know some at some point this year we'll get an announcement at least of of what their tour plans are going to be. And I figured it's it's been a while since we've talked about kind of the what the Gigaton tour is going to look like. And I think there was something I read maybe on our Discord, if I can plug our Discord. I don't remember who it was. Someone said that they they saw that, you know, Pearl Jam, when they were rehearsing before this, the Gigaton tour that was canceled, they were only rehearsing Gigaton songs. And I, I wonder, and, you know, we, we've, we've mentioned this, you know, in in passing a few times but i wonder if if they were actually planning on playing the entire album every night and i was thinking about what that would look like you know to kind of give ed's voice a break and to kind of give them a break i wonder if they were planning on and this is just me kind of brainstorming and thinking i think i think this would be kind of cool what if they did a gigaton set take a break come back do a set of like rare songs like you know eight to ten kind of like under the radar songs could it, could it be like an acoustic set kind of like a maybe Mansfield? maybe or like split it up half and half like couple do a couple acoustic and then you know transition in like they like they have been known to do the last few years into a more electric set maybe pull out a couple of old songs they haven't played in a while but like do kind of like a fan favorite you know a, a fan service set in the middle and then take another break come back and do a third set of hits then you come back and you get your Better Man, you get your Rearview Mirror, you get your Black, you get your Corduroy, you get your Jeremy, you're Alive, Ledbetter, all that stuff. I wonder, and then you send everybody home happy. I wonder if something like that was in the works. And I, I want to get your thoughts. And if, if people want to email us and, and kind of, it's live on four legs podcast at gmail.com, the number four. Let us know if that's something you you think would be interesting or let us know how you think this. Because I think there's there's something, there was there was something up their sleeve, I think, for this, for this Gigaton tour. It feels like, yeah, it feels like there was something. It feels like that, you know, I think we've talked about with the Mike face paint in the Dance of Clairvoyance video that they did. Basically, the only live Gigaton that we've heard so far has been that. And something could have been in the works. I, You know, this feels very pre-planned for them. And I, while I can see this happening, maybe like on one or two nights, like if it's an instance of like okay they're playing two nights at i think they had two nights in oakland maybe one of the oakland nights is that uh if they had two nights somewhere else maybe one of the other or you can even say amsterdam because they were doing two nights in amsterdam uh, in europe 
Uh, maybe one of the Amsterdam shows is that. But, I, you know, I think that they like more of the traditional thing because that's a very... And I think about like somebody like Bruce Springsteen because Bruce did something like that with the River Tour that he did a couple years ago. And, you know, there there are bands that will do that. But I feel like they kind of want you to come into the show unexpected. If they announce something like, okay, this is going to be this kind of tour, then it kind of, you know, for for some people, I think that kind of has an expectation that set. I don't think they like to set those expectations. I think they like to keep people totally in the dark. However, if something like that would have happened at some random show, and I'm going to give Oakland the nod here because I think we talked about last year, one of those Oakland shows was the Record Store Day show. So that could have been a very cool thing for the Record Store Day show. But I can't see them going throughout a whole entire tour doing 16, 17 dates, uh, whatever that number is, and just doing that the whole entire tour. I don't think they would have done it throughout the duration. But sprinkled in, yeah, I can see two or three. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's it's going to be interesting because like they've they've done that. Like I think that this would maybe be something that would be kind of a switch switch for people, and it would be it would be unexpected at least at first. You know, I think there's a possibility that we might get something like that. Now, and you're talking. Were you talking about what would have happened, or are you talking about what is going to happen when it does? Both could be okay. both. Yeah. Because I, I was kind of answering your question about what would have happened. What what's going to happen? I think that there's a potential that we could get the full Gigaton album every night. I really yeah. do, because I think that they're really itching to play it. It's going to be two years since the album comes out that they're even going to get a chance to play it, most likely. Maybe that there's a, a, a rare chance that they get to keep, you know, the, the See Here Now Festival and the Ohana Festivals going. I, I'm not sure where where that's where that's headed right now, but if, if those are on track to, to still keep going, then, then who knows? But those are festival shows. That's a little bit different. It might not be until, until early 2022 that we get any sort of yeah. assemblance of arena shows. So, yeah. but yes, I, I, I think there would have been and would be now that we're, we are kind of looking ahead. I think that Gigaton is going to be a massive, massive presence once that, that tour does happen. Yes. And you got to think too, like more than one band member is going to be, rapidly approaching 60 when this when this tour comes around so they they can't keep doing the things that that they've been doing i mean there's gonna have to be some sort of some sort of pacing or some sort of like you know we already we've talked about how some of the shows in 2018 were starting to shorten up a little bit you were starting to see some 27 28 song set list instead of the the 32 33 that they were gonna use josh Klinghopper as the opener yeah yeah so I think like breaking it up like that and playing all of Gigaton, that's that's material that that's comfortable for his voice. It's recent; he doesn't have to stretch a lot. He can knock that out, take a break. You know, I think there, I think there, there's going to be the structure of this tour could be a lot different than what we've seen before. It's it's very possible, and and look, I'm open to all possibilities right now, and uh, I oh, yeah. think we'll just we'll take whatever we can get. Of course, of course, if it's yeah. more traditional, and they decide to go the first night out, they decide to just ram you with the hits because they they just haven't played Corduroy in two years or Alive in two years. Like that's okay too, and and that's fine. And obviously, you will get some of those massive gigaton songs that will be sprinkled in. But um, as far as doing, you know, themes. We'll just have to see. Uh, I, I think it, there's a, a massive possibility that that could happen, but I think it's a, a wait and see approach right now. Yeah. All right. But yeah, well, let let us know if you've been thinking about that and, yeah. and what you think of those ideas. Absolutely. Yeah. That's that's a great discussion to have. That's a great discussion that you guys can uh, have with us over on our Pearl Jam podcast community group too on Facebook. So if you're if you haven't joined that, just search exactly what I just said: Pearl Jam podcast community. Just search that on Facebook. It'll pop up, and you can request to be in, and I'll I'll get you in right away. Or you could join our Discord. Uh, again, I think you just search the Discord. Search Live on Four Legs. If you have Discord, that's easy. Download it. The app, it's free. It's easy. 
it's done. All right, uh, this episode, this show that we're about to do right now, Columbia, South Carolina, 2008, this was actually a Patreon request. Mind my manners for not mentioning that before from Michael Keating. Uh, Michael's been waiting a little bit of, uh, of time before we got to this, so thankfully we did get to this. I knew, I knew that we didn't get to it last year, and we had to get to it very early on, so here we are. And Michael, here's your show. And, and he, he sent a little bit of a story. Just he didn't really have too much. But, uh, uh, he, you know, here's just kind of from his perspective what was going on. So I don't have much of a story beyond that I was at the University of South Carolina for an internship in the summer of 2008. My friends and I that went to Lollapalooza in 2007 were doing Bonnaroo and I couldn't make the trip and was obviously devastated when Pearl Jam played such a killer show that night in Manchester. Fortunately, Bonnaroo wasn't a one-off great show, but a harbinger of things to come for the truly bonkers 2008 tour. Columbia was the first show after Bonnaroo, and without getting too spoilery, we already kind of did. They didn't just brush up on the rarities for the farm. By the third encore with the house lights on for indifference, I was fully enraptured. Not touring an album allowed them to really go deep on the song selection. And yeah, like that's all stuff that, that we brought up and that's all stuff we're, we're really looking forward to, to talking about with this. Uh, you look at all the albums and there are eight studio albums and a lot of Lost Dogs in here. Everything is very balanced. That's what we'll talk about. Everything's being very balanced at the show. And right off the top, we are going to kick it off with a song that we usually don't talk about what happens when we don't talk about a song for a long time we need to appreciate it a little bit more and this opener right here off the riot act album that opens the riot act album it's in our graces i feel like they opened with it a couple of times in 2008 so let's hear a little bit of can't keep and then let's appreciate it i want to share i want to wind up I want to leave this mind and shout by hell All these lies like an ocean in disguise I want to live forever Can't first time that they played it out of 25 times in total they'd only played four more times in the 13 years or so that uh, they'd been touring and uh, this I'm, I'm surprised that it doesn't get utilized more or didn't get utilized more in the riot act era I thought that that would have been the go-to more often because how, how many shows happened in 2003 too many to count how come this wasn't every other night, like an of the girl kind of thing, or, you know, even with this avocado tour, it felt like life wasted or worldwide suicide was happening every night. Right. Yeah, I don't know. It almost it kind of felt like this almost got relegated to like an Ed song because it was on, you know, the ukulele, ukulele records. Right. And it almost felt like it, it kind of became his thing, but this is great like this is a this is maybe the one of the best versions of can't keep that i've ever heard and and like you mentioned like i don't think it's been played since 2014 it didn't pop up at all in 2016 didn't pop up at all in 2018 so it's one of those that's that's definitely due for a comeback and if if they can play like this i'm all for it man this is this is a great ed version a great mic version we'll talk about that a lot in this show Th- there was some cool lighting going on they had like a back backdrop with some like pictures and some lighting effects i i love this as an opener it was it was fantastic one of the best i've heard in a long time it's actually very timely that we talk about this song right now because last week ed participated in a benefit live stream and this is what he played he only played one song and decided to go the ukulele round he played can't keep which is that that's pretty deep catalog kind of song for him to play you would think okay if it's just him solo maybe he's doing something from into the wild and to to pull out can't keep 
I think that's a nice little nugget there. I, I haven't even gotten to, to watch that performance yet, and I know it's just him just kind of playing a ukulele outside, and there's not much to that. There's not much different that you haven't heard from that before, and I'm not a huge ukulele guy, but uh, definitely got to check it out because it's the most recent thing that we've had, aside from him singing in Hawaii with somebody at a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, I agree with you. I thought this version was fantastic. Uh, I was paying attention to Stone the whole entire time and Stone playing that capo down to like the sixth or seventh fret. It was really, really low down. And I think it was, it was trying to imitate that ukulele sound. Yeah. Sounded very really close, good. very yeah. close to that. And then just the scream out of Ed at the end mm -hmm. that, oh man, oh just some great stuff when they can get to it. And I, I think I'm with you on this. I, I don't know how many of the 25 versions of Can't Keep that I've listened to and really studied. So this might have to be my favorite version. I, I think I'm I'm in with you on that. It almost had kind of an of the girl feel to it. Like it, yeah, had, a little bit. it had some it had some tension. It had a little bit of uh, it took you on a little bit of a ride. It was really good. And I think. You know, going back to the ukulele thing, I think Can't Keep was the one that kind of kickstarted him because he he had found the ukulele and he was like, oh, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna get some I'm gonna get some sad I'm gonna pull some sadness out of this thing. You know, we're gonna I'm gonna pull some emotion out of this thing because you, you think of ukuleles, you think of like super happy, like upbeat kind of like light heart, light music, and I think Can't Keep was the one of the first ones he wrote on the ukulele, if I'm not mistaken. It's a lot different than than anything else on that record, really. And yeah, I mean, I really like it's it's great that he that he pulled it out for a recent live stream thing. I hope I hope that means he hasn't forgotten about it and it, it can come back at some point. Yeah, I I think what's great about this version too, it just soars. I think that you know yeah. when you think it can't keep, you think it's kind of almost one dimensional a little bit. The ukulele sound doesn't really reverberate, but this felt like it was bringing the whole atmosphere together for a show and a really good kickoff. And to follow that up. Why Go All Night and Hell Hell are the the, the three songs that kind of get you into this show and get you kind of acclimated. And one thing I want to mention about Why Go is that, you know, I don't think Why Go was used way too much on the 2006 tour. It was used, but I think 2008 was really the first year where they were like, okay, we're all in on this because 13 shows they played it all 13 times this year. That's it pretty sure that's pretty yeah. incredible. Yeah, it is. And I think it's the the crowd too. I think if you know if we were to if we were to do an evolution on this on our Patreon, I think that would be the main thing is the crowd really kicked this song into gear cuz you can almost see when when they take it there there's a little clip of Ed and there there's a full video for the show. You can see the clip of Ed when he kind of the crowd kind of hits him with and he kind of, he kind of like acts blown away by it like like whoa you guys like okay and you know give give this crowd some credit in Colombia like not not a hot spot you know the first time they've ever been there but this crowd was ready that they, they were ready for why go and you mentioned stone on can't keep stone again on why go is in great form um there's a there's a great little kind of different melodic kind of feel to the solo from mike and the, another another great version love this why go how about All Night? This is the second time that they had ever busted it out because they debuted yeah. it at Bonnaroo. So the, there's a little hiccup to start. If anybody knows me and, and sort of my history with the band, All Night has just been this song that's followed me around. Kind of, kind of like a gnat that you, that's just swarming around your head and you, and you keep swanning at it and maybe not the same gnat comes back, but there's still a gnat there. So, you know, All Night has kind of been that song. And no matter where I go, it could be anywhere in the United States, I seem to, I seem to get it, even though it, it's been played only 26 times total. And it was actually this year, my first ever show, that I, I got it for the first time. And I think it, it happened at, like, the first couple shows that I went to. So I, 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 I don't. I don't love this song. I don't love this song, but it, 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 they, got, they got through it pretty well. It was a pretty tight version. Mike had a really good solo off of this, and, you know, this is really kind of the kickoff of, okay, well, it's a lost dog. We've never played it before. Now here it is. Let's utilize it to, to, to our advantage. 
Yeah, it, it, you, it does have the false start in it, but it, it, it builds to, like you mentioned, a really great solo, a really great ending. They really got to somewhere cool with it. And and think about this. If I were to ask you before before you looked it up, which song has been played more, All Night or Can't Keep, what would you have said? Oh, I, I knew the numbers on that. I would have said yeah. All Night. Yeah, yeah, All Night's been played more than Can't Keep. That's crazy. Just 26 more. to 25, yeah. Um, but this is kind of the beginning, too, of the... the we got to mention these... There's there's some guitar issues going on. I think there, Ed Ed talks about having some issues with with the tuning on his guitars. There's yeah. a couple of these are are start out pretty rough. In this little section, the, the next few especially, there's definitely something going on with with the tech or with the guitar or with him that kind of maybe kept it from from flowing like they would have liked it. But again, very minor issues. I'm sure if you were there, you barely even noticed, but it's just one of those things that you notice going back and listening. Yeah. There's a moment that's going to come up later in this that is very apparent at that. It's just finally, it's finally bugged in and, and it's got to him. So we'll, we'll yeah. get to that when we get to that, but hell, hell too need to mention that because uh, I, you know, a lot of this show, it feels like stone Jeff and Mike are just gravitating towards each other and just playing with each other and feeding off their own energy. And I don't know if maybe does that go back to just sort of there being a sound issue and maybe they need to be closer to each other to kind of see what they're doing. Is that the case or Hmm. they just fired up and they're just working off each other's energy? Yeah, I don't know. I think a lot of it is the, is the set list too. And we can talk about that. Like this is a, this is a set list full of, of rare songs like i've i want to i'm going to get into some i've got i've got kind of a mind-blowing stat later for you a little tease here but this is this does especially this main set does not have a lot of the mainstays a lot of the moments that we're used to seeing and i think they were maybe just excited to come out and play some of these songs yeah they feel fresh they feel fresh a lot of these songs feel very fresh and you know what you're gonna get this and some of the you know the the closely knit live on four legs faithful people are going to get this but you know what it feels like it feels like a set list draft kind of show it does yep just you know okay like this one can go here and and i need to burn all night early and and i really like sad and they almost never play sad and and sad severed hand hand red, red mosquito like that's a section you never get something like that yeah, I thought about that too. If someone picked this in a side draft, I'd be like, "Well, that's not realistic. What are you doing?" Like, exactly, that, that doesn't right. make any sense. They would never do that. But here we are. Here we are, right? And and really, the year you could say that two thousand and eight was kind of maybe they were almost doing their own kind of set list draft, where it's like, okay, which one is next? And you know, instead of the uh, the old standards to to figure out the flow, there's no corduroy in this beginning spot where there usually would be. All right, well, how about sad? Why not? Why not try it? Yeah. Um, in, bet- in between that, though, I have to mention, Ed f- says it feels appropriate to say good evening to since we've never been here before, and it seems to be a pleasure t- to making your acquaintance, and the last time we played in the state was 10 fucking years ago, so we have a lot of catching up to do. And that's where they get into sad, severed hand, red mosquito, and already the disparity is very interesting. One song off of 10. Two songs off No Code, but three from the era if we're counting yeah. all night. Yeah. But two lost dogs in total and only one from the avocado record. That's something very interesting in total. Not a lot of avocado being played at this show for it being two years after the record came out. Right. Yeah, more more No Code than avocado. Yeah. How many times outside of Moline, how many times does No Code – tie for 10 and versus oh, that's where zero. we are at the show. zero yeah almost never right yeah and they they honestly they picked all the right songs for this show for sure um loved sad from this and i'm a huge fan of the song and you know we don't cover it enough and if we had another song appreciation day that, that we can do here sad could be it and there could be some songs later in the set but mike had a really really great moment in this and just kind of pulverized the solo in that uh, severed hand it, that, that's where that's kind of that that sound got got to you huh before severed hand did, did you hear that yeah yeah he's trying to play rough, that intro you know i guess i didn't realize that intro that he does that that 
had turned into at the time what how they would intro the song instead of the way that they did it off the album, which I believe was just pumped in noise, if I'm not mistaken. That, that, yeah, that I don't was know. just yeah. pumped in from the soundboard. But I didn't realize that that was Ed playing that. I just, I guess I assumed that, mm. that was Stone the whole way through. Yeah. Which is interesting. But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah he kind of pretends like his, his, his hand stings after that. Like, that, I don't know really what was going on with that. He, he kind of made a moment that might have seemed like there was a fuck up or something like that to, okay, he's just kind of laughing at himself, which obviously he does best. But, uh, you know, also, he just drops the guitar afterwards, which is, that doesn't usually happen in that song. Yeah, yeah, strange. But uh, Red Mosquito is is a highlight for this as well. It's, there was a moment, I think, where they showed Jeff and Mike, and they were just full, full force rocking out on this, like really just having a good time letting loose on it. And really great version of Red Mosquito. Again, a no-code appreciation is always on here from me, and... We, we mentioned the, these albums, four songs from No Code, three songs from Riot Act, only two from Vitalogy, only two from Yield. So a very strange kind of feeling to this main set. A little different different than almost anything we've done in a long time. But also, you have to think of a lot of the 2006 shows, too. And they were playing a lot of these places in 2006. Maybe not Columbia, South Carolina, but a lot of when you go up northeast, you know, they played New York. They yeah. played... The, the Boston area they went to Mansfield they played all those places so they have to come in it's only two years later everybody remembers what they did they have to come in and completely change the game yeah you know yeah. so I, I agree I love the I love all the no code stuff from the show I think it's fantastic and you know just the the idea that that things are completely different and are kind of changing to be something unique is I, I don't think people talk enough about this year and, and enough about that aspect. So I agree. Uh, in between Ed mentions, he doesn't mean to placate, but there are some nice faces and some good feelings coming from this room. It's been an emotional few weeks and we're sensitive right now. So it feels pretty good. So there, there could be a couple schools of thought about this one gets mentioned later and is, is pretty much done throughout the whole entire tour. We'll talk about it, but uh, Thomas Young is going through some serious, I think he's in a coma at this time. Uh, the veteran who uh, had a movie made about him, documentary Body of War, and we'll get to talking about that. That uh, is going to be in the encore in this. And I wonder if, if that is where Ed's mind is at, but you also, you had another thought about this. What, what could it also have been? Yeah, there was a lot of stuff going around with the, the West Memphis three at this point. I wonder if, if that was maybe playing on their minds too. Cause I think there was some stuff going on, like they had maybe gone to visit them or there were some, some benefits, some activities going on that, that kind of was in 2008 was kind of a big resurgence. That was a big push for them. I wonder if, cause you know, they were all heavily involved in that, uh, the, yeah the members of Pearl Jam. So I wonder if a combination of those two things maybe kind of weigh in on them a little bit. I would think so, yeah. Especially a song like I Am Mine can kind of relate to so many different situations. And, and you know what? This is a pretty intense version of I Am Mine, so you kind of you kind of see where they're they're at with this performance and and it kind of shows off of off of the speech that they had that you know it is impacting them whatever it is that's going on they're feeling it with this performance for sure yeah definitely you know and my my thing with i am mine is always i i want it i want there to be something more to it. i want it to get to another level and this one it wasn't the solo but it was that little break before the solo where it felt yeah. like they really got into it and really were feeling it. and you see, you see Ed kind of from a little extra hard on that it, it was it was great and loved it yep it fits for right in the middle of the set here and uh following up on i am mine uh ed says maybe we'll do a request later that's a little hint i think that there was a sign in the crowd and i'm wondering what it could be i'll get to my thoughts on that later uh but stone is getting his guitar f- fixed during this jeff and matt are kind of fucking around and ed mentions is this the home of the cox well i feel right at home and mentions it's basketball and who's the biggest cock, not the president. I mean basketball player. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean I remember from even from from high school. I'm mean, there used to be you know they, they used to have those college hats that would have like yes. the line and the line and the two lines and it would be like <laughs> and the the one for South Carolina just said cocks. So that was kind of like <laughs> a 
kind of like a frat boy go to back in the day if you had that hat. So yeah, that that brought back a little little memories of that for me. Yeah, I think there was one. I can't remember what it was. I, I, it might have been, it might have been UMass, and you take off the M. The M was taken off, and it said UAS or something like that. Mm, yeah, and maybe it was like the University of Fordham was FU. There was oh, okay. one that was definitely turned into FU, and then I, I know that exact hat. It was like a white hat, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, that was the big frat boy one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, at, at the time I was like 10 years old, so I thought it was the funniest <laughs> thing on the planet, but uh, <laughs> it's a relic of history now, I guess. So, yeah. uh, that, uh, transitions you into even flow. And since so far it's been a really good Mike show, it's going to have a powering even flow solo for Mike. And it's got pretty much an 11 on the Jimi Hendrix skill. It's right there. It's, I mean, he's playing up as low on the front board as he possibly can. And, uh, the one thing I thought we were going to get, and we did. It, there was like a little hint of it, and you kind of heard Matt kind of ramping up a little bit, and then it just kind of it just kind of died out, and we didn't get a Matt solo. But that's, that's all right, because we've gotten it in other shows. That's fine, uh, but not here. What would you think of this? It felt a little bit like just organized chaos. Like, with, with all the guitars going, it felt like they... I mean, right going into, you know, going into Mike's solo, it kind of felt like they, they were just all over the place, but it was, they brought it together. And like I said, you know, you're waiting for that, you know, Cameron solo moment. That was a lot of 2006. So you're thinking, okay, but instead he brings it way, way down. And they almost like completely stopped the song before coming back in. And like, you know, Ed comes back out on stage and, you know, gives it to the crowd. It's a really cool moment, but yeah, you know, again, you know what can you say about McCready and even flow i mean that that's his moment to shine and here it is right in the middle of the set absolutely and what's cool about this uh, you see ed when he comes back out on stage to sing he uh he throws a bottle of wine in the crowd and then just gives it to the crowd to, to just sing back to him and they kind of sing back and forth with each other and eventually the bottle got thrown back on stage i thought that was interesting <laughs> did, he, did he throw a full bottle of wine into the crowd then it just got passed around vigorously drank and then here you go you can have your bottle back and yeah, why well, did they keep the damn bottle we'll have to ask michael yeah i don't know fun fun stuff and one for the mystery machine i suppose where we have another case that we're working on great singing great guitar playing ed during this yells something back to matt he's trying to get a story from him I, it sounds like he's trying to get information for the story he's about to tell and he says there's fond memories of South South Carolina. Soundgarden got pulled over in, in a red van and the cops went in, tore all the cushions out. And they thought that Chris Cornell's homeopathic tea was a mushroom baggie. That's a pretty funny story. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, you see and there's the immediate thing of Cameron, like he immediately knows it kind of points back to him like, oh, he's he's got a history with South Carolina. He kind of like. He kind of throws his fist up in the air like, yeah, you guys remember that? Yeah, you really, you were there. Yeah, so it must have been, I don't know when that was, but yeah, pretty funny story. And I, and I can attest, you know, being in a being in a van in, down here in the south is, is you, are, you are definitely targeted. We were, you know, even even my band, you know, a little, little punk rock band, we were definitely targeted a few times. And, you know, we, we were lucky to escape a few times. But, yeah, it's, uh, I, I, can, I, can, I can sympathize with, uh, with Cameron there. Yeah, I, I, considering down south, I don't know if they would know what homeopathic right. tea would be. Exactly. So, yeah, it's a good thing that they kind of got off pretty easy there, or else who the hell knows what would have happened. But yeah. uh, Ed does tee up the next No Code song, The Third of the Night, and actually The Fourth of the Night is in this little section here, as one that they, they don't play all the time, but you might know it. So off he goes, into Elderly Woman, into Present Tense, that's all your no code right there fantastic incredibly balanced and ed is playing an electric during off he goes i thought that was very interesting and he is having some guitar troubles during it and i wonder if the acoustic maybe was having some difficulty and he didn't want to go back to that i don't know what the case with with that was but he switches guitars in the middle of this and it definitely sounds like he's frustrated with something 
Yeah, it, it definitely did sound out of tune, and we'll we'll get to the the story in a minute. But yeah, this this off he goes sounded it almost sounded like a little countryish, like almost a little like the, the area, a little maybe a little little pop country. Off he goes a little bit, like maybe a little Nashville feel to it. All right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Considering that they were in Nashville for yeah. a couple days, that yeah. you know they uh, they went to, and played Bonnaroo, and then actually the next speech he hung out. Uh, mm-hmm. They all hung out in Nashville with Kings of Leon and said that they're a competitive bunch, so they played games like horseshoes and stayed up late uh, to see who could have the biggest hangover the next day. So that that's. That's that's a an interesting tactic to do in the day between you play at like three in the morning and then play a show the next day and have to drive to play a show the next day. Interesting tactic, but if anybody could do it, and they were still in their forties then, so I guess right. if there was the time. Uh but Ed Ed said that he fucking won. Do you believe it? <laughs> yeah, I do. Okay. But yeah, I, I mean I was waiting for the pedal steel to kick in on this one. But yeah, and the, yeah, the the contest was like who could stay up the latest and who could have the worst hangover. And I think he he attributes like I'm not sure if it's my ear that that's fucked up or these guitars, but something's going on. Yeah, yeah, that's that's every every guitar I'm handed is in tune, but it's out of tune to me. Uh, so uh, there's some sort of miscommunication, that's for sure. But you know what? Like that's, that's part of it. And that's part of the story and, and telling the stories from the show aren't just telling the stories of the performance, but kind of what, what was going on in their world as well. So that's, that's what makes this, this show, this show. So, uh, elderly woman comes next. That is a great sing along and good crowd. I noticed at this point, I didn't really notice the crowd being that good at first, but it really felt like elderly woman broke them open and, Maybe they, they were starting off pretty good, but here's the thing. Elderly Woman is their second singable hit song in this. That's right. Yeah. So no wonder. They're not going to sing All Night. That's the second time they've ever played the damn song. They're not going to sing Sad because it's something that was played 38 times before that point. Red Mosquito is not a song that really gets sung. Why Goes probably and Hell Hell are probably the only two other ones that you can really get that crowd participation from but not not happening with a lot of these songs so that's interesting that elderly woman is really the first one that kind of speaks to you with with crowd wise definitely and and definitely needed i think at this point too you know on the the back half of this is not quite as as you know rare as the first half but you still need you need a sing along at this point, you know, and, and it's a good time for small town. I like kind of the the cool down after even flow, like you know, not an acoustic off he goes like we mentioned, but a little bit of of a, a mid tempo song to kind of give people a minute uh, before you ramp it up again. And yeah, again, the crowd really good, small town and present tense. And I think Ed is kind of trying to feed off that crowd presence because during present tense, he's he's letting the crowd have that first chorus, belting it out. They sound great during it. And that second verse, Ed just reaching that level with his voice was just incredible. Uh, you know how he gets on present tense, but this was a good, good version for that. strumming incredibly hard while the strobe lights were flickering made for a really really co- cool moment but then what the hell is going on here this is ed's frustration he's ripping the strings out of his guitar at the end of his performance yeah that's some just, insanity yeah i think it got to him a little bit i think that was kind of the last of it though like it felt <laughs> like everything from here on out was like okay it's been fixed I think in, I I got shit. There was a little bit of a 
of a tuning thing at the at the beginning, but they 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 got it cleared up. I think I don't know if it was if it was Ed's guitar or someone else. But there was like felt like there were a few wrong sounding things at the beginning of that guy's shit. But yeah, I mean that I'm sure during during the break they got that stuff cleared up right away and got it taken care of. Definitely the climax of all that ripping his guitar strings out. Interesting, interesting visual. This next song coming up next is the first Vitalogy appearance, which is very weird. Vitalogy really doesn't get a lot of love from this show. I think it's just this and and another one in the encore, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. But whipping and I got shit, and you want to call I got shit a Vitalogy era song? Go right ahead. Uh, but that's the section here, and you're getting the quick little adren- adrenaline rush with uh, with whipping, and then I got shit. Like you mentioned, there was a little bit of a, a sound difficulty in that, but he changes some of the lyrics. I got questions, but I got to go to school to get a mass line, and the ending to I got shit felt really massive. It felt like they ramped it up a lot, and they kind of ended on a real strong point there and I, I i thought they should have built built off of that because the next two songs this is sort of in the set list draft the next two songs are the kind of songs that you're you're like well a lot of the stuff that i wanted was taken and i kind of i have some needs i i need yeah, to get a versus yeah. song i need to get a, an avocado song in so i don't want to use them later so i'm gonna use them right here that's what this felt like you know, I, I don't think I, I wanted Army Reserve Glorified G before you're ending the main set, but it was it was fine. It was fine. I, I actually kind of liked the performance of Army Reserve, to be totally honest with you. Yeah, it's no, nothing wrong with it. But yeah, it felt like a, a good opportunity for like an immortality or a blood or something yeah. like something a little more energetic because Army Reserve is more of like a – it's it's got some tension to it when it's played right, but it's more of a it's more of a down tempo kind of feel to it. It doesn't have that same like same energy that a lot of those other songs have. But yeah, I mean it's 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 a strange strange way to end a set here. Uh, Glorified G is one that I that I don't love, um, but I, again, Stone does a great job on the on the backups, and it's it's fine. It, it fits in with this whole hey, we're gonna just throw a bunch of stuff at the wall here. And then they, you mentioned the you know the first vitalogy with whipping. It's it's taken us this whole time to get to yield as well. Yeah, evolution close on the set is that's that's the that's the first appearance. That's kind of crazy. So most of the rare stuff that you're getting are, are the things are the dogs are also you know the no code which they never play. So and you have to think Army Reserve is only the second avocado song. That's their new album. They're technically still. If you wanna, if you wanna say that a tour for an album starts when the album comes out and ends when the next album comes out, they're still touring for Avocado at this point. So three Avocado songs is very, very light from this. But that's kind of what makes this this kind of special, and and why you know they wanted to go to some of the deep stuff. Glorify G, another one that you know they they brought it back in in two thousand three. I, I assume that they didn't play it too much between then and and when they did bring it back for the first time. So fine, but a little bit weird to have as the penultimate main set ender. And then ending on Evolution, I like when they do it, but they needed... I, I feel like the build could have been a little better to this one. Yeah, it needed... You know, now I think it's, it's better now because they do kind of the the South American version of it where yeah. you get a little bit more interaction, a little bit of call and response and... Yeah, this one, it's fine, but it just it didn't have the set ender feel to it, the showstopper feel to it. Exactly. I think when you kind of, and, and it, it's a song that just sort of ends abruptly, it, it just kind of stops, and sometimes there's that awkward pause where it stops, and then they kind of say, all right, thank you, and they walk off, you're like, all right, well, maybe one more would have been nice, but that's all right. The, the song, the performance was pretty good. I thought Ed's voice was really good in it. Stone had a really good solo finish fine but you know sometimes it kind of it leaves you wanting wanting a little bit more which is is great because i think the encore did a good job bringing you back into that mode so that's where we are right now why don't we take a, a break for a minute or two talk a little bit about patreon this is a patreon requested episode from our friend mike and uh if you want a patreon requested episode that's something that you can get did you know that did you know that john can you tell them I, how they can do so? I did. 
Yeah, you can go to uh, patreon.com slash live on four legs or search for live on four legs on the Patreon app. You can uh, join it if you would like to request a show. That's our gigaleg tier, which is $5 a month. You will be able to uh, send us a show. Maybe it's maybe it's a show you were at. Maybe it's one you feel was underappreciated. Maybe it's maybe it's a big one that you that we haven't gotten to yet that you really want to hear us talk about. So you can you can hit us up on that. You can also do uh, the one dollar tier, the bonus leg tier, where you get access to all the bonus content that we throw up there, all our bridge school episodes that we've been doing, all the evolution episodes, all the setlist drafts. The you know that we did, we did uh, a, a ninety one show yeah we did a nineteen ninety one show on Patreon last week which was fun and uh, then we have our Horizon Lake for for ten dollars a month you can uh, you can get in and you can you know we're working on this uh, the Concertpedia project we've been working on getting that going and you know get you get to come on and have your own episode you'll get kind of a producer credit on on the website that we're working on live on four legs dot com so there's there's something for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. And I kind of made a promise last week and it seemed like some people were very excited about this promise that I made. And, you know, our goals that we're setting for 2021 were already two months in. Can you believe that? We're almost in March. By the time this airs, March is a stone's throw away. That's kind of crazy. But, you know, I made I made a little bit of a promise that if we reached 100 patrons by the end of 2021 or whenever we do in 2021, we'll throw another party the size of the Christmas party that we did. We'll make it special again. And apparently you guys reacted to it because we have three new patrons this week that we want to thank. We want to thank Joe Iarachi. I hope I pronounced that correctly, but he joined the Gigaleg tier. I know he's really interested in doing the set list draft, so hoping to have him on in the future. Uh, TJ Kindle has joined the Horizon Leg tier. Can't wait to get his profile episode. Obviously, for the Horizon Lake tier, you get your own profile episode that we'll do on Patreon, and that's going to be free to everybody. Everybody can listen to that on Patreon, so that should be exciting. Can't wait to do TJ's profile episode. And uh, also, we uh, are a new patron from, I believe, I I don't know if he's from Australia or New Zealand because his email said New Zealand, but I thought I've talked to him before, and I thought he said Australia, but I, I... I might be wrong. Uh, William Reese is now a patron and we thank him as well. And I think he's contacted us before. He's a really nice guy. So all, all great stuff. Thank you so much. And, and another bonus thank you goes out to Brock Miller, who has increased his, uh, his patronage to the horizon tier as well. So he's going to get a profile episode as well. That was a big week. And uh, obviously we thank you all, you know, we're, we're out here just, talking about a band we like and uh you guys are obviously responding to it so it's it's our humble appreciation to just try to give you as much possible as we can back to you guys that's amazing thank you all so much that that really means a lot that's great 15 away from 100 that's it so if you want to be one of the 15 patreon.com slash live and four legs download the patreon app search live and four legs or just go to any of our social media pages. You'll probably see it posted. Help us out. We'll help you out. We'll give you more content. That's what this is all about. So, all right, let's uh, let's dive on into the encore here. And the way that they begin it, there's no talking. There's no nothing. This is just going right back into the music. And I actually, this is very similar to the first show that I, I went to in, in 2008. This was my first ever show at, at MSG. And they did the same exact thing. No addressing the crowd. They walk in, start playing inside job, and it gets a massive reaction from the crowd. I remember not really knowing that one since it was a deep avocado song at the time. I didn't really know it as well as I did the earlier stuff off that record. So the reaction that the crowd, that it received from the crowd, I was very surprised. And just even this, a version like this, it's actually not surprising looking back in hindsight because this is freaking phenomenal. It's fantastic. It has a very spacey vibe to it. It's kind of hypnotic in ways. Uh, Mike busts out the double neck guitar, and that's an awesome experience there. He doesn't do that with a lot of songs. And, and just powerful, powerful version. They, they play this once in a blue moon nowadays, and it feels like it's not enough because it feels like it's a song that people need more often than not yeah it's kind of become synonymous with steve gleason and that whole 
thing and it's yeah it, it should should be played a lot more it might be the best song on avocado and i love i love it in this spot you know i, I love it coming out of the encore here because you get kind of a one at a time band intro right so he comes out like you see mike comes out starts playing you see jeff come out you see stone matt and then ed comes out last almost right before the vocals start it's it's a very kind of dramatic and impressive way to start an encore i like that they kind of give give each member a a, a spotlight as they come out and that's the way the song's built it's very well done very good very good placement i love this here and like you said a great version of the song one of the highlights from this feeling of absolute euphoria at the end where Mike kind of hits that solo and he, he sounds like he's playing towards the gods and you know automatically whenever you hear that live you feel good you feel good about yourself and I thought this combo to kind of play off of that was perfect because you need another positive song to feed off that positive energy what are you going to do throw in a footsteps throw in something that's a little bit more moody a little bit more deep no Head to give and fly on this. I thought that these two back to back were awesome. These were fantastic. They soar into the atmosphere, they get your blood going, and then give and fly when you get that drum beat and kind of revs you back up and everybody's jumping up and down. I can I can see and you can kind of feel that crowd when you're watching it on YouTube and when I've been in that crowd for versions of Give and Fly before, you, you feel that moment coming from that. And I think that was a great build to put those two together. Definitely. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> one we're going to play is due to the nature of our environment obviously we talked about before the college town so education is thrown in the set list this is the fourth or fifth lost dog I, I'm, I'm losing count here but uh it, there's a lot of lost dogs so it's it's rare it's a rare dog it's only the fifth performance of it they've only played it a total of nine times I'm my education is my own occasion relevant somehow while you're deciding when I've been finding looking around in the here and now if I've been taught from the beginning would my fears now be this before but does boom usually have this kind of a presence on it 
Yeah, I, I, I wrote that down as well. He gets like a solo. Yeah. I don't remember hearing. I don't remember hearing Boom solo on Education before. I mean, it, you know, like there's only nine versions. It would take less than an hour to listen to all of them, <laughs> but we, we could easily figure that out. But that's yeah, the kind was, of evolution was, episode I want to do. Exactly. Exactly. It was uh, it was very cool. You know, I, I liked it. You know, something, something again, just more rare, more rare treats for this crowd. Right. This would definitely be the rarest of the bunch, unless like if you're counting, if you're counting time-wise and play-wise, then maybe the next one would probably be the rarest of the bunch. But this is this is right up there when you're thinking, okay, under ten times. That considering the only four times after that, and one of them being like at a big show, PJ Twenty. There's not a lot of opportunity to play the song elsewhere, so pretty cool. Sometimes I kind of forget about education a little bit. It just kind of flies under the radar, but I do like the song. I think it's a a cool-sounding song. It's something that isn't really in their catalog too much. Yeah, they don't have other. Think about it. It almost was the closing track on Binaural. That's so would have been very cool. That would have been. But yeah, I think I think now I think I'm gonna I'm gonna hit you with this. Dude up with these these stats that I did here because I think we're kind of in the middle of this this little education thing. Say we're the, kind of the rarest song of the night. We'll say nine times played. So what I did was I went and this 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 set seemed very strange to me. And so what I did was I went and looked and I wrote down all of the times that each of these songs have been played, and I averaged it out over the whole set. Okay, so you look and there's there's just as many songs played in this set that have been played less than 100 times as there are played more than 400 times. That seems crazy to me. Like, no Black, no Corduroy, no Jeremy, no Daughter, no Rearview Mirror, no Animal, no State of Love and Trust, no Yellow Led Better, no Go, and no Once. So I averaged out all of the, the song plays on each of these songs, and I came up with an average of 214.57. So that Ooh. means the average song in this set was played only 214 times, which I looked up as about the level of like a deep or a dissident. So those, <laughs> those are the two closest songs that thing. Like played much nowadays. That's the average. Yeah. So then I went, I was like, well, that's, that's, that seems low, but I wonder how that compares to like another show on this tour. Cause originally I was like, well, I can, I can compare to like a 2016 tour, or like a 2003 tour, but let's stick to the same year. So I went to the night two at MSG, which uh, granted a lot of rare songs played that night, right? You yes. had who you are. You had the WMA stuck around. You had, uh, rats. If you're so, considering uh, black diamond in there too. Yeah. I'm considering black diamond in there as well. Only played three times. Right. So I, I went and I did the same thing and I averaged up all the plays from that show. And the average on that show is is 251.17. 30 30 more, 35 more than this one. I think this this could be one of the lowest average shows they've ever played. Well, you have to consider where where does Vic Theater lie into that, you know? Right. Like, yeah, I mean th- this is this is one that's that's right there with that. Yeah. I think yeah, I, I, the, you're on to something there, but then, you know, you well, have, just, we, we, I wish we had Dave here from Life Foot I know. Stuff, this is right up his alley. Yeah, I know. And maybe maybe we can get a bonus on that at some point. I, I wouldn't be surprised if this was in, you know, the lower, you know, lower third is giving it uh, that a lot of room, but like maybe bottom 25. And, and I would count, I would say like 2003 would be the start of where you count this stuff because yeah, that's exactly where yeah. you get shows that are 28, 29, you know, 30 in the books. modern era. We'll exactly. Say. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, that would, that would be an interesting thing to go and count up. That's for sure. So hmm. maybe I'll come back next week and we'll, we'll, we'll check Vic theater and we'll check a couple of them and see how they rank with this one. Interesting. Good. Nice little, uh, nice little discovery by you. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's the kind of stuff that, that is, uh, yeah, that one's for my math nerds out there. Right, that one keeps you going for a little bit. I wasn't even thinking that deeply into it. I was just thinking, hey, this is pretty rare stuff. Sure, let's just talk about it. But that's what that's what you do. You go a step further than that. So, <laughs> WMA, how about this? This is where they say we're going to take a little bit of a request. 
and I'm wondering if somebody wrote it on a sign because they knew they played it at Bonnaroo and they're saying, guys, you got to do it for us too. It's only fair. You can't just tease us like this. And it, it, it's like, it's kind of like the, the St. Paul show from 2014. It's right in the middle of Moline in Milwaukee. And it's like, guys, what are you doing? Give us, give us something to feel like we belong in this little, you know, this little crowd that, that we're sandwiched in between. So they, they, they give some fan service here. They take the request. WMA is brought back. This was brought back for the first time since early 95 from the Japan tour in 95. That was the, the last time that they had performed it before then. And this is the, and we're just talking full versions here. We're not talking about tags. We're not talking about daughter, but this is full version. Only the 10th time that they had played WMA in, in full at the show. I think you're right he must have seen the sign because he goes over i think he goes over to stone first and he's like you see him like conferring with stone he's like he's got something on his mind like he's like wait da, da, da. you see we're doing this and, da, da. and then he goes back to matt he goes over to jeff he goes over to mike and he's like make sure is everybody okay we're changing this up so obviously this was not on the set list and yeah you see you know stone has to go and change his guitar gets the acoustic and they start playing the the acoustic intro to wma i don't think nobody really recognized it at first it's, but you you get that moment of recognition when the lyrics start and everyone's like yes. oh this is cool this is cool okay and i the, wonder yeah, if great lot, great moment i wonder if those a lot, a lot of those people were privy to what happened two nights before at bonnaroo and they're like okay yeah. th- we we didn't get hosed on this and you know they didn't go up to uh dc or or wherever the next spot was and then played it there WMA got brought back for a lot of these shows. They played it at five of these shows. This, this is the second of the five. And obviously the MSG shows had the, uh, the backup singers that were involved with those versions. Also, maybe the band is feeling a vibe off of this where it's like, okay, we, we really felt it. We got this. This was done differently. We played it acoustic. It was a bit of a, it wasn't a Dave A monstrous drum beat. It had familiar kind of a sound to that to what Dave did but not as anywhere as close to what the pacing was or, or how hard he hit but this this version is really really good and it gets really powerful in the moments that they're singing along with and you know like I think the acoustics the acoustic version kind of allows sort of the vocals to take the forefront of this for sure yeah I agree Great. Again, with a lot of these songs in the set, they they really build to something really cool at the end, and it it almost felt like they kind of like when they got to the kind of the jam part of it, they kind of looked around at each other, were like, okay, this is pretty good. Like I, they they kind of felt like they they got into a little bit, and they were kind of channeling some of that original spirit of it. And you know, Ed sounds great on it, so yeah, great great performance, W and Anna. And a lot of times we talk about these versions that get switched up dramatically in kind of these. Where a lot of train, a lot of there's a drastic change in a song, but this one, I, yeah, like I said, I don't mind it. I think it's it's a different feel to it, but it, it gets to the same place, and I think it's cool. Yeah, there's not going to be a whole lot of full versions of WMA that we'll be talking about. Uh, maybe there might be one or two in the in the future. Don't know. Stay yeah, tuned. I, I, I got to see one, so I'm good. I did too. I got to see it twice. Yeah, yeah. So we end the first encore here. Better Man, Save You and Porch. Better Man's a great sing-along. 
there aren't a lot of hits at this show. So especially, you know, the last couple that you got, Education, Lost Dog, WMA, you know, people are singing along to it. But, you know, you, you have to think the casual crowd are in for the radio singles. WMA, not a radio single, just a side A song on on a 90s record. But Better Man really felt like the crowd kind of got back into it in the same way that they got into Elderly Woman. It felt like the big sing-alongs from this show were very, very, very good. Yeah, it's almost like the lack of them made them that much more powerful yes. when they hit. And the, the, the crowd in, in Better Man is, again, great. And Ed kind of fakes them out a little bit, kind of coming back in with singing. He like, he'll go up to the microphone and, and they'll start and he'll be like, nope, not yet, not yet. <laughs> They'll oh. come up to the microphone. Nope, not yet. Yep, not right, yet. right, right. I think right, he fakes them out three or four times before it actually comes back in on it. And yeah, it's a great moment. You get you get Ed and Mike playing guitar off each other. You get Jeff and Stone over on the same side, kind of playing along. It was it was a great moment. Tons of windmills at the end of that too. Yep. Yeah, they're yep. having fun. And one of the things I kind of know, you know, no no tag off of this. They're just kind of letting it letting it kind of ride to the end. So that's very yep. interesting. Yep. Um, save you in between here though, like that's not really a spot that you get save you. You don't get save you in an encore spot ever really. Yeah. And, but again, great. Like I love the little extended base bridge part that, that Jeff does. I I'd love save you here. I think it's one of the underrated songs. I would love to see it in this spot. Yeah. It's, it's being utilized as like that bridge builder. Like, okay. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I don't think you really need the bridge to build to porch, but why, why the hell not? Like, yeah, a lot of times you'll get like a whipping there or a state of love and trust or something. Or and, they'll go or a straight, comatose or something. Yeah. They'll go straight from Better Man right in the porch. Yeah. yeah. So that works too. Yeah. And and look, porch also just massive climax to end a set. The wine bottle gets passed around. Ed is kind of sitting on the side stage. That was kind of interesting. And Mike and, and Stone are both jamming together off the solo and creating a very incredible chemistry on that. Um and then picks up a guitar kind of midway through, goes up, picks a guitar and shines the light onto the stage. Uh, that's something that he usually did in like a wish list or a half full. So I don't know if I've seen that done on porch before, but that was very cool. Yeah. Great. You know, if you, and this is a, this is fast. Like it, if you like guitar heavy porch, like this is right up your alley. Like you mentioned Mike and stone kind of, it's not they weren't really dueling but they were kind of kind of trying to lift each other up a little bit it felt like they were right in the middle of the, of the stage right in front of, of Matt and it that was great I, I, I love watching that I, and Stone can definitely hold his own on that it sounded really good this is a great version of Porch this, this is this is a great encore very you know not a lot of not a lot of things that we're used to but it, wor- it worked out really well I, I like this whole thing yeah, the whole performance is, and you know, in general, and not just setless wise, but just the way that they were playing. It, it's a good example how, of how engaged that the band was all night, and how tight that they were feeling on stage together. They they were, you know, in two thousand and eight, they can they can play with their eyes closed and they could still create an energy and create the chemistry. So that's that's no surprise there. But to continue doing that night in night out for you know, honestly, this was a. 13 show tour but it doesn't matter you have to create that and uh they, they were doing it at that time so great great stuff and uh you know there's not too much more going forward it's the second encore is is three songs and then we get kind of a, a, a finale so to speak but um there was a bit of a missed opportunity and i'm not going to dock them for it but I, I there was one thing that i saw in the encore too, I'm like, okay, there's something missing to this. There's something that they could have done. They could have gotten rid of something to add something. And I'm not there yet. We'll get to that in a second. Cause there is kind of a moment that Ed is having to talk to the crowd here. So Ed comes out on stage with the acoustic and everybody's chanting it for Eddie. And Ed says to them, you know, it is the most humble way possible. Got to be careful. Cause someone would hear that and they'd turn into an asshole immediately. And then he says, ask the crowd if, if they want to hear a funny or a sad story. And he kind of goes into this thing where he's talking a little bit about the Middle East and about the troops. And he's like, you know, I, I, I wish I had a, a funny story to tell you off of that. But he, he gets frustrated during this and he's talking about money. He's talking about the president and, you know, 
this was the time and this is this is this is still bugging him even what five six years after the fact where they're really hammering these 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 storylines home at the riot act tour so the reason why they're they're doing it because uh, they're talking about Thomas Young, who we mentioned before. He had a major setback at the time. If you know his story, you kind of know what he went through and and how he was injured in 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 Iraq and you know never signed up to go to Iraq because nobody signed up to go to Iraq. So you know at this point he was actually in a coma during this time and uh, Ed was kind of. A little frustrated with the ordeal, said he wouldn't apologize by saying the things that he did, but thanked the crowd for listening. And that's where he gets into an acoustic version of the song, No More. We've talked about it a couple times, and this one was one that you pretty much got just about every night on this tour. I'll let you I'll let you talk about the song. I, I, I don't have much of an opinion on the song, aside from it's got a good message to it, but I don't know. I, I, I feel like... Anytime that Ed does something kind of acoustic at a show, I'm taken out of it a little bit if it's not predominantly Pearl Jam. Hmm. Uh, yeah, and that's that's interesting. Yeah, I'm 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 not with you on that. I I, I kind of like the acoustic stuff uh, when he sits down and kind of gives you a break. But I mean, yeah, no more. It's it kind of is what it is. It's it's a hard on your sleeve thing. We t- I think the last time we talked about it, I remember we mentioned it's like kind of like a Woody Guthrie song or a Phil Oak song or something like that. Very much in that you know tradition of, of folk singers like a uh, Billy Bragg or something even you know for something a little bit from more from the eighties. But it's it's fine. I mean, you you got it. Like I said, you got it a lot on this tour. It's very much of the era of the time. It's it's not something that they would bring back unless there was some other sort of, you know, situation that called for it. But there's just not much to it. It, it just kind of is what it is. Here's a great point for you if you want to go on your stats for, for this show. This is the only non-Pearl Jam song that they played on no this No covers. No yep. covers. Not yep. even a Crazy Mary. No, no no last kiss. No Baba, no rockin', nope. nothing like that. Yep. This is it. And... <laughs> literally every song is Pearl Jam universe created. So, yep. yeah. It doesn't happen very often anymore. Nope, not at all. But here you're kind of throwing it back for the old school fans, and uh, you're getting footsteps in Encore 2, which I don't know how many times they've done footsteps in an Encore 2 at this point in their career. Even with all the studying that we did, I know that I think they did it at that uh, that Philly show at the Spectrum as part of that and that's kind of where my point is with this as i'm going back before there was the opportunity that they could have thrown once into the middle of this and done a reverse mama song what'd you think about that yeah i think it looked like footsteps was a request too because he, he's there's the sign that he hangs on the on the monitor that's got the the two feet footprints for the o's and footsteps so uh, someone definitely had a sign so i wonder if I wonder if this was even on the original set list. Maybe another one just like, I like was WMA that was just added. It. Yeah, I was trying to look for it because I was interested to see if maybe they had to cut once for time and that was their, their idea. But yeah, if, if this was a request, then I, I can understand that, you know, throwing once yeah. in in the middle of that. But, you know, that's that's interesting that it's technically really your penultimate before ending your set with a live and then basically cut off and walk off and finish like that yeah hmm you would almost think they would build back to a live with once or something along those lines yeah it would have been it would have been interesting cap on this show for sure to get to get a mama san late in this would have been a really interesting way to end this kind of strange set but yeah i mean close up sounds great you of course get the harmonica which is which is fine so it's it's not like a like a sing along like a better man or a small town, but it's it's one that everybody knows. So the crowd sounded great on it. Thought it was thought it was really good. Felt like a very delicate version of it. It it fit the mood, I think. Yeah, and boom, kind of set the mood. I, I think with that piano backdrop, it really it, that was kind of the tone for this one. It was more uh, along the lines of the emotional, the darker route. Like you said, it was there wasn't really a sing along aspect to this. But, mm-hmm. you know, not a lot of th- those exaggerated, what I had to do, like, none of that. 
they kept it very simple for this. So very, very interesting to note. And if you're uh, if you're on the Patreon, definitely go and check out the Evolution episode for Footsteps because it's very, very good. And even if you're not on the Patreon, hopefully that's that's a sell for you guys that uh, that aren't on there because we have a lot of those songs that are just really fantastic listens that we've done for the evolution series. So, uh, before going into a live, it has like a line or two of singing, uh, James Taylor, sing a little Carolina in my mind. In my mind, I'm calling the Carolina. Just I don't know what it was, but it, a live felt like it didn't find its energy until, somewhere in the middle until maybe like right before that you know is there something wrong she said it felt like it was just kind of it was kind of muffled and maybe that that's why i'm thinking okay a bridge to build between footsteps and alive would have been nice there to kind of to kind of ramp yeah. up alive and, and make alive feel like more of a moment not saying yeah, and, that it and wasn't you, but and you wonder too you know he we talked about before I am mine. He mentions like, you know, it's been kind of a rough few weeks. I wonder if, if they were thinking about some of the same things before this one and maybe kind of had a little bit of a cloud over it and until, but again, it, like you said, it, it kicks in. It looks like, looks like Jeff, you know, Mike having a great time on their side, really into it, you know, a lot of crowd interaction, a lot of pointing and, and getting into it. So yeah, it felt like they were, uh, they were getting ready to, uh, to be done. To, That's to, what it to, seemed to finish like. It off. Ed says all the normal things that he would say. He says, I guess this is Southern hospitality. See you in a year or two. Do your homework, graduate, change the world. And then he tries to balance a wine bottle on his head and runs off stage. The house lights are on the entire time. There's no change. And the yeah. only, yeah. you see people in the video, you see some people start to walk up and start to get up and walk out. But the only indicator that they would be coming back on is that you're not getting house music playing. So there are some people that I guess are savvy to that, that are saying, all right, well, let's stay an extra minute. Let's see what happens. You don't get when, whenever that music plays and you kind of, you, you might be expecting one more song that maybe they'd come out for. And I'm not just saying Pearl Jam. I'm, I'm saying with other bands too, that maybe, maybe you'd get one more. There's kind of like a collective oh, from the crowd. There's a collective groan whenever oh, yeah. you do get that. And you're like, okay, well that night's over. That's when you know it's over. Exactly. Yeah. And, and there are some bands that honestly, they don't even do encores. They do like 27 songs straight through or whatever they do. And they just do two hours, two and a half hours, whatever, and they don't stop. They keep the house lights up, and, and you get a, a very elusive third encore, and there's no addressing the crowd before it. The The lights stay on, and indifference pops up, and I, I think that was the right way to close it. You, you didn't want to close with a Rockin' in the Free World, a Baba, a Ledbetter. I think there were so many unique and rare things that happened at the show, and it was just sort of a, a just a different beast of a show. Indifference was very fitting for this. I agree. The only thing I you know I wish they had they had been able to, to cut the lights because indifference is so much better under under the darkness. I think it. I, I don't like it as much with all the lights on, but yeah, that, you know that's 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 neither here nor there. But yeah, I mean a little little treat for the people who who stayed and stuck it out the whole night. Very bluesy version from Stone too. I'm, I'm yeah. here for yeah. that. That was that was really great. Ed thanks uh, Kings of Leon who opened the show, and uh, and that that has it for Columbia. Pretty interesting show. Where do you stand with your top three moments from this show? Because there, there are a couple that you yeah, can go to. Huh? Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with with Can't Keep at the beginning. Great version of Can't Keep, maybe the best, best I've ever heard. You know, Ed sounded great on it. You mentioned the, the vocals. Mike sounds great on it. I thought it was a great opener. Present tense. I'll go. I'll go as as a, as a moment on this again. The the crowd kind of getting back into it. You mentioned Ed reaching for that that second verse sounds absolutely great and kind of the the kind of bringing that bringing that no code part home and that that main set with the the fourth one there already. And then uh, it's tempting because I I love the WMA. I love Better Man. Education was very cool. 
I gotta go inside job as uh, as my my last one because I the entrance I, I love it coming off of that encore in that spot thought it served its purpose very well great version and uh, yeah that that's my three so for my third moment I I am gonna say WMA for my third moment because I, I just it, it felt like the crowd kind of kind of knew what was there and they knew that they were getting something special. They knew that it had happened and they recognized that. And I think that they were, they were seeing that as, as a treat for them. So that was, that was a really cool and obviously something that they weren't planning on doing at this show beforehand. So a uh, great version of it. And then I'm, I'm kind of with number one and number two, they kind of go hand in hand together inside job and given to fly just works so well back to back and you want it especially after the main set kind of closed a little bit wonky like army reserve glorified g evolution all right you're not you're not building to get them like ramped up for for the encore at all but you forget about that right away and you're thrown right into this with with these top two songs right here and it felt like those are the kind of moments that you go to pearl jam shows for 100 percent that makes the show for me, both of these songs. So I'm, I'm not even going to give you a one or two on it. It's just going to, it's going to be, it's going to take the place of, of both spots right there. Both fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic yeah. work from Mike. Rating though. Uh, Rating is going to be interesting because there's a couple different directions that we can go on that too. So where, where do you stand? I think before the show started off, off mic, we kind of said to each other, I, don't, I, I have no idea what direction we're going to go with rating it. Yeah, yeah, and I kind of still don't. Um, this is one that if you're, I would say if you're if you're one of those serious collector type people and you're you want to listen to a show that's a little off the beaten path and you want to hear some different songs that you don't normally hear, this would be a great one. You know, if if you're if you're tired of listening to hearing the same songs over and over again, you know, if you're if you're sick of daughter, if you're sick of Jeremy, if you're sick of corduroy, if you're sick of black, like yeah, go go listen to this one. It it might might refresh you a little bit. Maybe that's kind of served the purpose of the band. But you know, like like I mentioned, there was there was a couple of clouds over this one. You know, the the Iraq war stuff still obviously going on, the the Thomas Young stuff, the West Memphis Three stuff that we talked about. So there's there's some guitar issues, so it doesn't flow maybe like it should have. So I, I I can't put this one up in the in the upper echelon as much as I really like some of the performances and I the no code stuff I love all the lost dogs you you love I'm gonna give this I'm gonna give this a seven I think it's it's it serves its purpose but it it doesn't it doesn't belong in the the upper echelon of those of those ones where it's just moment after moment of like classic Pearl Jam you know the last three weeks we've we've done all college shows, all college towns. And the first one I gave a 7.5. And the second one last week, Ann Arbor, I gave a 7.5. And this is like perfect C plus student for, you know, somebody that goes to class enough in order, you know, to get their diploma and graduate. And he studies enough, but he still wants to go out and party a little bit. And, um, it's, it's going to be a perfect C student. <laughs> that's that's how I am with this. I, I, I think it just just barely misses that that eight spot. Um, and the way that it could have gotten there, if you would have gotten a reverse mama son, I would have gotten you there. If you would have gotten a better ending to your main set, I definitely would have gotten you there. But besides that, I love the rare stuff. I really do. And I love some of the moments, like mentioned before, Inside Job and Giving a Fly are fantastic. Those are my recommendations from the show for sure. And and the no-code stuff is great. The other Lost Dog stuff, getting education whenever you get it, is nice to hear. WMA. And um, I, I am just falling below that line of where eight, I could say, is a really, really a great show. Seven and a half is just under that. So for the third week in a row, the C plus student stands, and that's where we're we're we're, we're graduating, but we're not graduating cum laude right here. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. So that's fair. yeah, so that's uh, interesting that how how that all kind of played out. I, I was not I was not trying to do that at all, but. Uh, yeah, I, I think next week is going to be a little bit different because we're, we're going back, you know, we did a couple of shows that maybe you haven't heard before and, and to mix in, you know, sometimes we do all the famous shows we did like drop in the park and the ice bowl and we did mural amphitheater. Those are shows everybody knows. 
last three weeks, we've been kind of doing some under the radar stuff. Next week, we're going back to basics here. Melbourne, 1998. How about that? That's a big show. 1998 tour. That's one that this is this year. This is going to be the year of 1998. We're going to be doing it a whole hell of a lot more than we have done in, in previous years, which I'm very excited for because you know how much I love that record. So this is one that I, I'm sure you have cassettes of somewhere, right? Give give way a time time to break out those Best Buy promo CDs, everybody. <laughs> you remember that? That was given away. That that was the there were only, there was only a, a thousand of them or something, and they recalled them, like it wasn't authorized or something. There was a whole controversy about that. I'm sure we'll get into it, but yeah, that was uh, that was a big one. Yep. Great, great show. Yep, and uh, can't wait. That, that's going to be our primer for our year of 1998, so to speak. And uh, hopefully we'll get to more of those very, very soon. But next week, Melbourne, 1998, a lot of you have remembered a lot of those performances. So we're going to be talking about all of them once we get there. And, and one for you Australian fans, too. I, I, I know Australia is tough because you guys haven't had a show since 2014. And even those shows were, were all big day out shows. And they haven't they haven't paid attention to you guys, but we're paying attention. This is our our third Australia show that we've done since the beginning of this show, which is actually, it's, it's, it's tied for Canada, which is pretty good. And considering that a lot of our, our listenership does come from Australia and Canada, uh, we should be doing a lot more, but that's why you're at least on our radar for one a year. And maybe we can get to more that, that, that comes with Patreon requests, people, patreon.com slash live and four legs. If you are, from Australia and you have an Australia show that you really want to hear us play, we'll spin it for you. Just head on over to Patreon and help us out. Uh, anything else before we uh, call it quits for this one? This was a fun one to cover and uh, a lot of stuff we haven't talked about in a real long time. Yeah, but you know, like I said, February, a quick month. We're gonna be we're gonna be into March. We're getting into the thick of this thing. It's gonna be it's gonna be fun. Yeah, I think you can call March pretty much a nineties month. That's hey, nothing wrong with that. Yeah, there's one there's one two thousand show. That's it. Which is kinda kinda rare for us because we like to splice them in every now and again. But yeah, there's gonna be ninety eight show, a ninety four show somewhere, uh uh Great ninety four show. Yeah, yeah. great ninety four, a great ninety two show. So oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, if that if that's uh wetting your appetite right there, then uh you're gonna wanna be tuning in for more. But please if you don't subscribe to the show, subscribe to the show because that's what it's all about. That helps us. You could do it on Apple. You could do it on Spotify. Hell, you could do it on SoundCloud for all we care. Whatever gets you informed about the show and gets you the updates, do it. It helps us get the visibility. And uh, then, you know, come hang out with us on Discord. Come hang out with us on the Pearl Jam Podcast Community Facebook page. And if you really want to on Apple, Go ahead and leave us a comment and rate us five stars. It's the typical thing to say at these podcasts, but it does help out the show greatly. So let's close this one on out. This may be the end. We're here, but not for much longer. And although we may be parting ways, I miss you already and I miss you always. Thanks once again, Michael Keating, for uh, bringing the show to our attention and requesting it with his Patreon request. And next week, we're going to be doing a request from me. Because this is one I wanted to do, so sometimes I get to add one in too. Melbourne 98, we'll see you then. In my mind, I'm going to Carolina. <laughs>